Well, good evening and uh, welcome to this Photo London Book Club session uh, with Steve McCurry. I'm, my name is Marius Quint and I'm Reader in Visual Culture at the University of Portsmouth. I'm delighted to be able to uh, introduce and interview Steve McCurry, who has been one of the most iconic figures in contemporary photography for more than five decades. I'm born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, McCurry studied cinematography at Pennsylvania State University before going on to work for a newspaper. And after two years, McCurry made the first of what would become many trips to India, some of which are, of course, featured in this tremendous book, um, Devotion, which is just uh, which is published today. Uh, Travelling with little more than a uh, bag of clothes and a film, he made his way across the subcontinent, exploring the country with his camera. And he's garnered many honours since then through various photographic adventures and uh, famous images, some of which we'll be talking about, uh, in particular, his celebrated image uh, of an Afghan girl, which became a kind of worldwide re recognisable uh, image. Uh, McCurry has been recognised with some of the most prestigious awards in the industry, including the Robert Carper Gold Medal, and most recently, the Royal Photographic Society in London awarded McCurry the Centenary Medal for Lifetime Achievement. And in 2019, McCurry was inducted into the International Photography Hall of Fame. So I welcome you, Steve, and uh, we look forward to having a really fascinating and indeed illustrated uh, conversation. So um, I wondered if I could begin by asking you about some of the most memorable moments of your life and career to date, Steve. Well, it's great to be with you today. Uh, memorable moments in my life. Well, I, I guess I'd have to mention uh, the birth of my daughter. I know that sort of sounds kind of corny, but <laughs> that was kind of a big deal. Uh, but I think certainly early when I was trying to get a foothold in in photography and freelancing and all of that, I think, um, and I, I'd already been to work, spent time in uh Afghanistan and Latin America I, I found myself in India finding looking for a place that I thought could tell great stories and in that two-year period I happened to find myself in Afghanistan I wandered in Afghanistan and I think that was really pivotal uh in my life in my photography and it was a story and a place that I've spent the last sort of 30 plus years uh, traveling in and out. Uh, somehow I really got passionate about that country and the people. Uh, a lot of friends uh, went back and the story kept changing, evolving. I always wanted to go back and sort of update my uh, my files and my work. Uh, so I think that was uh, a turning point. Uh, but there's so many moments uh, and places and people I've met in this uh, life, uh, you know, I think back to the the Gulf War, this this sort of environmental catastrophe, which uh, you know, it, it 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 the the entire region was in, engulfed in this uh, smoke and fire from the hundreds and hundreds of oil wells that were on fire, and it was it was epic. It was a kind of this, it was like uh, you know this sort of biblical proportions of this disaster. Um, and, and the, the the Gulf, you know, the, the Persian Gulf and, and Iraq and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia were all polluted in the, around this time. So that was uh, that was a, an amazing, important story that uh, you know really was so profound. It's often said that photography informs memory or modern memory and the way that we tend to recall things in terms of images, um, both collective ones, shared images, news images, um, and uh, and also personal ones, sort of private photographs and so on. Do you see, do you recall moments in your life in terms of that that, that iconic memory? Iconic memory of, of which moments again? Of the, of... Well, any, any moments. Do you tend to think of your life in terms of snapshots of photographs you know think of them and in terms of images in that kind of photographic way well, I remember all the pictures I've, I've I've made I remember being there at the time what, what I was going through uh the the you know the the struggles with the light and with you know whatever the situation so yeah they're all very vivid I mean the pictures really conjure up those memories of uh difficulty and uh sometimes triumph uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you know, 
things work out perfectly and it's like this is incredible this is amazing other times you're struggling for days or weeks to try and find a way into the situation get permission to go here go there mm -hmm. and uh and then voila something wonderful happens and, and you or you're not or sometimes you decide that the time and effort isn't worth that particular so it's always a gamble is trying to figure out you know where do i invest my time and my effort but the pictures um many of the pictures that i've used in that books and exhibition are are, are really uh kind of the memories are very vivid and i look at the picture i remember the people and, and you know, how we relate to each other and all that so mm -hmm. it's a great diary it's a way great way to remember uh my travels what was important because you know so that, that that's 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 a great thing mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm sure the audience uh, is eager, as I am, to see some of the images from the devotion uh, book and project. And I'm uh, so I will just ask uh, for the first of those to be uh, pulled up and uh, put into uh, presentation mode. Uh, so um, here is the cover. Um, perhaps you'd like to just uh, tell us in general a bit about the. Uh, the project, what were your motivations and thinking behind it? It's a project that spans many places and many years, uh, clearly. And uh, the quality is a very moving uh, book, I found, um, very touching. Um, but perhaps uh, instead of me talking about it, you should uh, talk about it and perhaps, you know, tell us a bit of the the ideas behind it, but and also maybe some of the particular images. Well, I think this is one of my, for me, one of my most important books um i think this is um i mean the qualities found uh, in this book the devotion are found all over the world it's not just the you know it's everywhere uh and i think the book explores the impact and evidence of devotion and action people who uh go to a place or with uh, a loved one or a relative or somebody who's devoted to you know preservation of, of the planet and environmental causes and um you know or, or, or maybe you know animal welfare human rights um i mean devotion can take kind of many forms and it manifests itself in many different ways but it's basically you know selflessness um, empathy compassion loyalty uh, uh but again it's this uh, involves you know action somebody who's uh my, my father was a perfect example of devotion he was um completely devoted to his, his wife who was sick and uh he, he was he was loving and with a sense of humor and would do things extraordinary things to try and make her comfortable so it was kind of a devotion of love um but um you know i think of people that are devoted uh, uh i think of the the man who started the emergency hospital uh, project in in Afghanistan, other places, emergency. Uh, I think he was exemplifies devotion. I think of De Mother Teresa. Um, I mean, anybody who goes to a place and works works with lepers and sick pe mm -hmm. sick people, um, you know, you really have to respect, you know, that kind of uh, you know devotion. And it, or or a doctor, you know, Doctors Without Borders, mm -hmm. uh, International Rescue Committee, or the Red Cross. I mean, these are often doctors and nurses who could have a very comfortable life in the suburbs, make a lot of money, uh, and but they're, they're off in these places, uh, you know, U Ukraine or wherever, uh, Afghanistan, and they're mm -hmm. they're trying to, you know, work with injured people, sick people, uh, and and uh, you know, it's just a remarkable devotion they have to their mm -hmm. fellow man and to humanity it's it's uh, it's really uh so so i think the book is um uh, is about those kind of people of course it's also um you know the cover here is 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 is, is monks in myanmar and burma who are uh, practicing their their you know their their buddhist uh, uh faith um mm -hmm. practice um and and they come here and they they're, they're uh praying but not to that rock they're, they're praying uh you know about the world and, and their practice and it's kind of a meditation mm -hmm. so um and 
the, the, a lot of the images um, that they, they span also, as, as you say, a, a range of you know spiritual, religious practices, also work, and and really selflessness uh, to a large extent, various forms of selflessness or and 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 commitment. I mean, is it is it um, this a topic that sort of has been gathering in your mind over the years, or did it kind of suddenly strike you that this was a theme that emerged from your photography or did it come from conversation it was really a theme that i've been something i've been working on kind of you know kind of unconsciously for for the last 30 or 40 years i go to places and i was drawn to these kind of people you know the albert schweitzer type people who you know comfortable doctor who was you know concert pianist potentially and uh instead of uh having this comfortable life in europe he uh went off to uh work with uh disadvantaged people people who needed help um so photographing those kind of people following those kind of people and eventually i saw this emerging in my archive as, as a topic that i had been following mm. all these many years and it might be interesting to put them all together um, nice. and take a look at how they they worked as a book well, let's uh, maybe take a bit of a, a, a trip through the some of the remaining images. So we have this second image. This is in Brazil. This is in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. This is this is in Brazil. Um, uh, there's I think there's pictures from um, you know all over the world. Yeah. So how do you? One of the questions that comes out from an image like that of the the Brazilians, uh, the Brazilian church. Um, how do you kind of take a photograph and keep it natural? Because obviously you're there and the people will realize you're taking a photograph. I mean, how does that, and yet, you know, they're, they're unguarded moments. Yeah, well, I, before I, um, I, I was in this area for about two weeks and I, I knew I wanted to photograph, you know, the community and all these different aspects. And so I went to this church and along with my uh, translator, we, as the I guess the priest, if we could go in and photograph during the the service, and then before the service, he made an announcement to the congregation that we have a photographer here. He's working on this project, and um, he's going to be photographing in a very respectful way. So I um, I photographed for I guess the first five or ten minutes. Uh, when he was speaking, I, I, I wasn't photographing. Then at the end, for the last sort of five or ten minutes, I photographed again. So I was just trying to be un unobtrusive. Um, but he had made an announcement to everybody that I was there photographing, and obviously, if there'd been any objections, I would have, I would have stopped or whatever. But everybody seemed to be okay with it. Fantastic. And uh, could we have the next couple of images? If we skip the golden rock one and uh, yeah so this is in oh this is Angkor Wat Angkor actually Wat, yeah. these monks were living uh in the background off, off on the left at, at a monastery and they were coming and going they happened to rain that day and and uh I, I was under the a roof and as they were coming up I, I was I photographed them uh from a from a dry spot but um so wonderful yeah. that's but it, otherwise it's full of people and it's yeah. great gra graphically this is, uh, again these are uh this is from the shallon school of martial arts martial arts which actually started uh in, in china in a monastery so there's this buddhist roots to this martial arts uh, school and um i thought this would be a great way to show these uh young men devoted to their craft, to their practice. Um, and um, I went and spent a few days there. Um, and I, it was just a, such a uh, such an unusual way of them exercising and doing their practice that I made many pictures from different things. I thought this was one mm -hmm. that was more interesting and unusual. Mm. And uh, the next one is Ethiopia. Yeah, this is Lali Bella. It's this ancient medieval church uh carved out of solid rock is probably five six seven hundred years old and and ethiopian pilgrims come all day every day and the women dress in, in this white 
uh, sort of dress uh, with this sort of flowing uh, shawl. And they walked through the, from the church out through this passage. And it was this magical moment with this sort of, the, the, the texture on the wall and this woman almost looks like like a bird or a butterfly moving through this doorway. And if we go to the next image, um, that's a very nice kind of visual description or pun almost there. Well, this is in Lourdes in, in France. I wish I could pronounce the name <laughs> better, but um, it's a place where people come that are sick um, and they come from all over all over the world. And I just, you know, this couple, this old couple uh, that, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know them. I didn't actually talk to them, but I can only imagine they had probably spent their lives together and uh, they were just walking on their way to uh, sort of the cathedral. And it was just this really touching moment that, you know, here they are together, you know, sort of at the end of their lives, they have this really, this bond and uh, and that word alliance, it, it just kind of all came together. And the way that the lines of the of the shutters all sort of pointing into the future, wherever that may go and so on, it's just got a real kind of harmony and energy about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the next image is in Mumbai, is that? Yeah, this is the Bandra train station. It's like the subway, the the commuter track that goes from the suburbs. And every Friday they have these, they close off the road to to cars. And they have, you know, these these Muslim men pray. And but the the pedestrian traffic, you know, continues. And this this I guess this Hindu woman had this load of these empty crates on her head, and she was just going about her work. But um <laughs> I know people have commented that you know it's the sort of you know men bowing to uh, you know the, you know this symbolically kind of woman and how how women have always done the heavy lifting and you know the family you know the one who's mm -hmm. the, the, the one who brings the family together and does all the you know, the work with the kids and all that so it was a, it's a homage to <laughs> to women in some way but and I like also like it because there's this one kind of the yellow. Uh, her 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 shawl her her scarf is like the one dominant kind of piece of color in the picture. Otherwise, it's kind of monochromatic. But uh, it it also it's quite interesting that what comes out in some of your photographs is the the coexistence of tradition, you know, and religious practice, but also modernity as well, and commerce and so on, which yeah. this shows quite well. What about the next image, which is also, is that India? Just, just the, the last one. I went back to that same location. I'm a big believer in going back to a place where you think it has potential for a strong image, going back multiple times. Uh, and, and you go there, you work it, and maybe like in this picture, this man is uh, paying his, uh, again, again, it's this, um, uh, paying his respects to his his uh, at, at a cemetery, at a, at a shrine, not a cemetery, but a shrine for his ancestors. Um, and um, I was with this community too for for several days, and I would go back at different times of the day, and and take a look and see if there was any activity. Um, I, I like the one of the things I like about this picture. He's he's a a semi nomad. He's from a semi nomadic tribe called the Rabari. And um, he's praying, uh, his fingers and the flags have a nice sort of poetry to them, the way they kind of relate to each other. Uh, so that was one of the things I liked about that picture. Um, this is in mm. Gujarat in, in mm. uh, Western India. And, and the next image is a very different context, isn't it? Yeah, this is, uh, again, the, you know, doctors and nurses and medical staff who uh you know spend their lives uh in devotion to humanity and making sure we're all you know uh, the, the the compassion they bring to their work is is uh is is, is very important Th this is a preemie who baby who um you know it's kind of touch and go at times with, at this age when they're underweight 
And uh, I just I always loved the fact that this this newborn child has this sort of smile and and a sense of uh, defiance. I'm going to survive and and uh, enjoy and um, and perseverance and you know uh, in in the in light of the fact that the kids you know, kind of mm. touch it now in terms of if it's going to survive or not. Mm. I don't know if he was reacting to the cold stethoscope or who knows <laughs> just as a as an image because obviously the, he, we don't know the child can't tell us what, but uh, it, it, this has a great expression and the, the caring doctors there are kind of making sure that this kid's getting full attention and care i should mention that um if you look in the chat uh, to our audience uh if you look in the chat you'll see uh, an order uh, an order form or you can click on a link uh, to order the book um devotion um and also that uh, and i can see perhaps one question's popped up there already but the q and a we do invite you uh for the last uh, part of the uh of our conversation that we can in, we'll take some questions select some questions from that so do you, please do put your questions in the q and a uh box uh which you can see at the bottom of your screens hopefully um We've got a couple more images, uh, Steve. We've got, um, this is Lebanon in uh, the early 1980s. Well, this was, uh, <laughs> uh, this was a, a neighborhood in Beirut, which was being uh, shelled by the, by the Israelis. Um, and th this conflict at this point had been going on for some years, in fact. Um, but the, again, this this mother uh, devoted to her family, her her daughter, trying to again trying to have a normal life, trying to make dinner, uh, and it's uh, the, the background is this devastation, which uh, you can't imagine what the other mm. part of the neighborhood looks like, and we're seeing these images now from. Mm. But uh, this is sort of the, you know, mm. four years ago, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and um, indeed, and the next one is um, I don't remember the the place where this was taken. Um, former Yugoslavia. Um, uh, it's a you know a, another couple you know coming home after working uh, in, in the fields and in the in the, in the barn and. They're heading back to their house. And again, this, you know, you look at the couple, it's, they have this connection, this, and, and you can only imagine what their life has been like. Uh, uh, you know, he, he looks uh, a, a little bit hunched over and I'm sure walking up that hill is not easy, mm. but he's, uh, despite her load of, of mm. corn, in the in the bag she's still trying to encourage and help him get up the hill to go home it's um it's also the landscape you know it, it looks well it might not be autumnal but it certainly looks like the end of the day and you know the kind of the waning of of the of time and so on uh and you have you know that sense of oldness in the in the landscape as well don't you yeah it, um, it, it, it is the day last yeah. sort of last light um, mm -hmm. Again, with a very slow color film, um, you know, very difficult to work at that time of day. You're kind of wide open mm -hmm. at a slow better speed. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, yeah, again, I, this is very kind of monochromatic. But I love the emotion mm -hmm. uh, and the obvious love that they and caring mm -hmm. that they have for each other, and beautifully understated as well um and we've got about three or four more images so um just uh, talk us through these i just happened across this young boy with this cow in the durbar square in Kathmandu, nepal uh and i you know cows are run freely throughout the city um this particular cow and the boy had some sort of relationship maybe he was uh, you know it, it, it lived with the family Sometimes cows kind of roam around kind of freely, uh, but certainly they, they, these two had a connection. And I just, uh, they felt so 
you know, comfortable. Uh, it, it just, it was a really unusual, I've never seen anything quite like this where the cow was sort of nuzzling this young boy and uh, both very at ease with, with one another. Um, you know, it, it's hard to, and of course, uh, uh, in, 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 in Nepal is primarily a Hindu kingdom. Uh, cows are revered and sacred and, uh, you know, you, there's beef isn't available to eat and um, they're, they're, you don't know, they're, they're not slaughtered. If you hit a cow with your cards, you've you got a serious problem mm. on you. And the next image is uh, of a place that is unfortunately etched into many yeah. minds. Uh, you know, this kind of Auschwitz Birkenau complex in Poland, uh, which was a death camp, and uh, people from all over Europe were sent into these camps to be exterminated. So th there's a group of uh, Zen Buddhists who do workshops and Zen workshops here, um, and, and they meditate in the barracks and on the track. Um, and it's, 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 uh, hmm. it's, it's a very kind of, uh, I mean, the, the, the feeling when you're there and knowing what happened, hmm. it's just overpowering. And it's, um, I mean, this image is, is quite distinctive in it's the way that this is one sort of figure there that's kind of almost intervening in that railway infamous railway line yeah that's, that's a good way of looking at it yeah what about the next image which um is south asia i presume in chiang mai oh right uh, thailand yeah the the whole story of elephants well around the world but in places like thailand and you know they um unfortunately um they're sometimes used for rides for tourists, and sometimes there's baby elves are taken away from their mother for commerce or for circus or some sort of uh, commercial usage. Um, I really encourage everybody in the world not to take elephant rides because uh, th this isn't a natural thing, and they're they're kind of beaten into submission. Uh, you know, but this particular place is sort of a you know, these are the good guys who help orphaned elephants and elephants who have been captured or taken away from uh, some of these bad practices. And they're brought here to get for real, re rehabilitation. And, and also, as I said, kind of an, an orphan. And then maybe some of them are reintroduced into the wild. But um, mm. it, it, this same story is in India and different other countries that uh, it, it's the practice is really quite sad because elephants are such an intelligent social animal and for them to be uh, forced into kind of mm. slavery is a terrible thing. Thank you. And the next, uh, the last image that we've got um, uh, is a quite a private setting. So what strikes me that you've got a, a, a mixture of, you know, very kind of public open spaces but very private settings could you maybe just tell us a bit how you handle that situation there's a few other images in in the book as well that you know are these very intimate moments there, there was a a, a project that was undertaken to to distribute medicine and for for aids patients and uh, they selected several countries for this pilot project and they they gave the medicine for free for willing participants uh we were part of the project to, to publicize it to, to make a doc documentary on it and so certain people were asked if they would agree to be photographed for for this project um so they this family agreed we had five or six families who agreed um and um as they the treatment progressed and and whatnot, I was I was able to document uh, their life. I was there like every day, um, 
and 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 I just was able to have full access to their their lives. And of course, we developed a friendship and uh, all of that. So it wasn't just photography; it was it, it this personal friendship component to it as well. So th this this man was you know dying of AIDS. Um, that, that was the situation here, a and his mother was uh, comforting him. Hmm. So it's many of the images are about in in a in a sense healing the world, aren't they? I mean, they they do have a, a very strong element of um, rectification in some way, or um, yeah. You know. I mean, here's a mother who's again he had you know he's 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 dying of age. AIDS mm. and she, with, with her, you know, motherly love, her compassion, her you know, loyalty to her son, her dedication, uh, her selflessness. She's there at his side, um, right to the right to the end. Mm. Um, and that, you know, if you're in his situation, you would want, you would hope that there would be somebody there to help you and be with you and give you company mm -hmm. uh, and and all of that so i mean it's like a very touching mm -hmm. time uh, that i spent with these people mm -hmm. I mean, emotional so all the all the photos are touching in their various ways and uh, i should stress there's over 200 pages in the book and uh, it really is a, a tremendous achievement and you know it, it's that sheer span and variety that makes it uh, I think uh, very absorbing. So, congratulations, Steve, on on the publication, uh, which again I'd say you can um, order uh, from the link in the chat. Uh, we do have quite a few questions popping up in the Q and A, uh, so we'll come to those. Uh, and I know that we want to uh, perhaps devote quite a bit of the the time that we've got left uh, for doing that. But I just um, wanted to sort of another one or maybe two of my own questions, Steve, which one of one of them is that I teach photography students at uh, the University of Portsmouth. And um, I wondered if you have any kind of career advice for them on becoming a photographer. Uh, what would you tell them or what would you have told your 20 year old self, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, I think I would say that. To really break it down into simple terms, um, it's going to take a lot of work, um, a lot of work, and you're going to have to work smart. Um, you need to know great pictures, history of photography. Not, not the. I think you need to look at a lot of pictures, some of the wonderful pictures from the past. See how photographers handled light composition, what kind of stories they gravitated towards. So that you can um, learn learn from them, um, that's important. But I think practice. Uh, you know that old joke about how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> practice, practice, practice. <laughs> that was yeah. the, the other night, and I wanted to stop somebody and ask them to see if they got the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Carnegie? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> um, Carnegie Hall is like uh, you know. Anyway, um, so th that's um, that that's sort of uh, the, the kind of sums it up: practice, mm -hmm. hard work, and uh, dedication, uh, perseverance, and mm -hmm. um, and and no, you know, uh, don't tell me that you're 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 a, you're a young photography student. You don't know the work of you know Bill Brand or. Or, 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 you know, uh, I don't know, uh, you know uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson or uh, Ansel Adams or Dorothea Lange or, or Andre Cortez or mm. Psy or uh, on and on and on and on. Because these are, I mean, it's just such a joy to go through their work, you know, Irving Penn, uh, to go through their work and see how they, you know, how, how did they handle portraiture? You know, if you want to be a portrait photographer, how did the greats do it? they're light how do they how do they you know somebody walks into your studio and says okay well i'm here mm. uh well, i got about an hour uh what do we do what should we do how do you want to mm. how do you do this? Mm. 
<laughs> and then it's up to you, the photographer, to take control and, and kind of find the picture somehow. So I think the, the my my advice is uh, just work. You have to work. It almost has to become photography is not like some professions where you kind of walk in at nine o'clock in the morning, hmm. leave at you know five or six. It, it's 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 a kind of a way of life. It, it and unless you love it and have to do it, it's like well maybe I'll be a photographer. Maybe I'll be a you know a sculptor. Maybe I'll be a hmm. sell carpets or something. No, no, no. That then forget photography. Do it on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Photography, if you absolutely have to do it, that if regardless of whatever income you make, uh, you're still going to pursue it because you have that 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 burning, you know, in your gut that that that, that, that you, you got to do this. That, that then you're on the right. Then that's your path. <laughs> Fantastic advice. Thank you. And music to my ears, and that you know the importance of looking at other practitioners and past past masters as well um very much so um we've got questions about uh, technology and so on uh, coming up in the text but um i do want to just kind of ask you about you know the changes in technology that you've seen uh, that have how they've impacted you and perhaps how you know in particular the kind of change in the methods of distribution of of photography you know going from uh you know from the the analog format to digital but also you know the the way that photography has moved to some extent from the newsroom to the art gallery to some extent you know we do tend to see documentary uh photography uh you know appearing as art and so on and so i'm just any reflections on those kind of themes the changes that you've observed in the nature of photography uh, and its impact on you well when I was starting out, the only way you could get published was through basically a magazine, magazine, newspaper. Um, the good news now is that you can put your picture online, um, you know, social media, whatever, and um, on your website, you could send your picture electronically here and there. If it's good work, if it's great work, it, somebody will take notice at some point in the old days you were beholden to perhaps a picture editor and if they didn't want to pass your work on nobody would see it um so it's actually good now that you can kind of get your picture out there in the world electronically but um it's it's it's, mm. it, it's not easy it's really a lot of you know it's mm. difficult i mean there's there's so many more photographers well they've i've heard that since since i started in in the early 70s there's always been a lot of photographers but there seems to be more now and now everybody had every literally everybody has a camera in their phone which is good i think that's that's good i don't think everybody should be documenting their life that's that's a good thing uh, but there's also a lot of photo reporters out there with their cell phone which is also a good thing but it just um to, to be to really cut through all of that and come up with a set of pictures or a story uh you know you just have to persevere you create this sort of critical mass and hopefully over time it develops into something well thank you and um my kind of final question i think before we go on to the uh the submitted ones uh, do you have a favorite other artist or photographer and if so who and why well i would say Henri cartier Bresson. i think uh you know, he, he worked as, in the sort of 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, he was one of the founders of Magnum Photos. Um, he, he was just a great image maker. He a uh, um, great portrait photographer. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he the decisive moment was something that he, he didn't really coin it, but he, um, that was what he, he had a book. He, one of his first books was The Decisive Moment um so uh i would look i would say he uh his great sense of craft his composition his light his his, his storytelling uh just uh out of this world and and uh uh just the way the way he could juxtapose things and 
uh, he, he told me, I, I used to go to his house quite a bit and show him a book when I came out. Um, and he always said, well, yeah, if for your own personal work, I would, I would recommend shooting in black and white. And uh, for your commercial work, it would do whatever, you know, shoot in color. But I never took him up on that advice. I decided I'd go my own way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because the world's in color and it's more mm. kind of authentic, especially in some places in Asia, the, so much of the story is the color. So um, I, um, but he, he was for me, the far and away, the Irving Penn was, I would say was another one who, although he worked primarily in the studio, um, maybe 95 plus percent of the studio, but such a, an incredible genius when it came to portraiture, just uh, amazing and still life photography getting cigarette butts off the street and making it some kind of wonderful image. Mm -hmm. I think those among okay. two are the people I look at. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, Steve. And um, so I'm going to move to some of the submitted questions. And um, so uh, one of them is how did um, you sort of handle your, I don't know if this is in fact someone who probably knows a bit about your technique, but how did you, handle the your style transitioning from uh, shooting on Kodachrome to digital, if that's the case? Well, I actually prefer digital primarily. I mean, I like the look of Kodachrome. Um, very slow. I, I can't really shoot it in, indoors for lack of light. Also, color balance with the tungsten. Um, so at the end of the day, when it got late, I had to kind of sh shift to a tripod, which is another set of problems. But with digital, I'm able to shoot in, into the night and still, you know, stop action. Uh, with Kodachrome, I, I'd have to get, go down an eighth of a second, quarter of a second. Um, and that was difficult because, you know, people are moving. Um, and you could also um, evaluate your frame the focus, the composition, the, a particular moment with, uh, with with looking at your... So I, I was in um, Afghanistan, was photographing this boy selling oranges, and it was really dark, but I was on a tripod at, I don't know, a quarter of a second. And I was got the film back two months later, and I realized that the entire all the pictures were back focused, meaning I focused on the, inadvertently, by mistake, it focused on the wall instead of on the boy. <laughs> it, it's sort of okay, you know, but you can see that the, the wall is tack sharp and the boy is, is a little bit. So it was, you know, with digital, I could spend five or 10 minutes with him. Before I left, I could evaluate Oh, I could realize that maybe I can salvage that and re refocus the thing. So that that's another advantage to to digital. Um, uh, I, I think the look is fine. I mean, maybe mm. digital maybe 10, 15 years ago, you could make a case that it it wasn't really up to the mark. But I think today, um, it's 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 mm. damn good. Yep, fantastic. And um, question about uh, your decisions uh, regarding projects so do you usually have a clear idea on uh, what your project will be um, about when going somewhere or not so do you have a yeah a clear conception of what you're what you're up to <laughs> I, I kind of have a loose idea a place that I think is going to be uh, you know visually rich um, and uh, I, I have a, a lot of themes when I go to some place, um, you know, human activity, human behavior, uh, people working, people playing, I mean, children playing or, uh, you know, faith, spirituality, uh, the marketplace. So I go to a place and I, I have a number of ideas and themes that I kind of follow. Um, you know, I was in Ukraine recently, so I was kind of interested in, in what was happening uh, towards the front line and all that. But I, I would say that um, I, I like to keep an open mind, go to a place and, and just sort of wander around and see what what kind of moves me and what, what mm -hmm. attracts me. Um, mm -hmm. 
and and uh, hopefully one day one of those pictures will end up in a in a book or an exhibition. Uh, I, I like to learn about cultures and people, mm. so um, mm. I like to wander around and, and mm. kind of. And um, I suppose somewhat related to that is the question: What's the longest you've waited for the perfect composition? Well, you know, it's always a gamble. You go to a, a street corner or you're looking out the, a window or you're waiting for something to happen. And um, it, it's just a question, how important is this and how much time I want to invest? And you wait and you wait and you wait. Sometimes something happens. Sometimes something happens and it wasn't quite right. So you kind of wait again. And then at some point you either just pack it in and say, I'll come back tomorrow. Or you say, um, this just isn't, actually, it's not worth the time, the investment mm. in time. Mm. Uh, my time would be better off um, somewhere else. So you kind of leave that. So, But I, I've, 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 I've waited for maybe an hour sometimes mm. for uh, at a particular uh, place, waiting for the light or waiting for uh, something to happen in front of something and some mm. juxtaposition. But I, I'm, I'm not a very patient person, so sometimes after after a few minutes, if I, if I think it's the, it's not worth, it, I'll just push off. Mm. Good, thank you. And uh, a question which relates to what you were saying about the vocation of photography and knowing you want to do it. But uh, when and how did you know what kind of photography you are and what uh, you want to say? It's a tricky question, perhaps. But well, right from the beginning, I gravitated towards the work of, you know, Elliot Erwitt. Um, uh, I, I was looking at the at, at some of the books of Don McCollin, Andre Cortez, Walker Evans. Um, and, and I was looking at Philip Jones Griffiths, this incredible book called Vietnam Inc. He was Welsh, uh, amazing guy, uh, amazing photographer. Um, and I gravitated towards that kind of kind of humanistic documentary work and uh i just thought yeah that, that for me that was the only direction to go in so i kind of uh worked on my college newspaper and then i got a after that i got a job in a kind of a you know community newspaper and then i, I realized that, that this was wasn't fulfilling what i wanted to do and i just started traveling with the indian never looked back I, but I, there was no plan b hmm. No plan B. This I was going to do this. Whatever it took, if I, even if, it, if I didn't make any money, hmm. I, I was going to. This was this was what I was doing. Hmm. There was no safety net. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in relation to kind of looking back then of your career again, I, I suppose there's the question: um, How do you go through your past work and organize it for your next projects? Or in other words, what's the thought process there? So this relates, I guess, to the devotion project as well. Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I look through my work all the time. I'm always going through my archive and looking at pictures. Um, and it's just, it's kind of an organic process of looking and deciding, well, maybe uh, let, let me look for, for this particular theme. I did a book on animals uh, several years ago and I went oh. through my archive and looked for... Um, all different kinds of animals and domestic situations and wildlife and just to see how it all fit together. And um, I, I thought it was, it was a great project. I, I, I love animals. And uh, so it's, it's, um, it's just something that I have a few other ideas in the works. Hmm. And, uh, it's a slowly kind of, it's like on a slow simmer. And after a while, I just sort of decide, okay, now it's time. Now it's time to move on to this other, book project hmm. so is the it's a, kind of relates to another question that's been submitted which is that um are you personally aware of any patterns that emerge in your photographs either you know in terms of the composition or the the uh, subject matter or the meaning in them and is it do you feel it's deliberate or you know it, it, is it something that um that you search for beforehand or is it something you look look at you find retrospectively well, I'm looking for a particular story in the picture, some some activity, some 
human behavior, perhaps. Um, so I'm not really thinking about a style or this or that. I'm looking at it thinking, does, does this work? Uh, and, and just graphically, does it work? Does it tell a story? I'm not thinking about, um, I'm, I'm just going through the, you know, my brain is sort of all these elements is kind of going at the same time, the, you know, the, the, the color and, 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 but what's happy, what, what is it about this particular that's in front of me that, that moves me that I think is something that says something about the world that we live in. Um, hmm. Sometimes just a little detail it could be a crack in the sidewalk. It could be a dog asleep somewhere. Uh, it doesn't have to be some hugely, you know, profound um, story. It could be just something kind of. Uh, I'm mean, just shooting little notes here and there all the time. Hmm. Uh, but it's. I, I don't want to. I try not to think about. You know, I'm, I'm never thinking about. I got to do a Steve McCurry. <laughs> hmm. Whatever is <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to look at something and say okay well i love the story i love what's happening in front of me it's a couple or it's something going on and um how can i what's the best way to tell that story where, where do i crop the frame um what what kind of you know lens do i use to hmm. tell that story it's simple i, I like a something that's sort of a more of a minimal kind of simple photograph in a simple pot. So it reads. Hmm. Thank you. And, and relating again to, well, a couple of more technical questions. First of all, there's a couple of questions about editing and, you know, certainly something that my students concern themselves with editing software and so on. I mean, do you have any particular views on how that should be done or is done? Uh, well, try and, have a very light touch <laughs> I, I think that uh i think the the pictures should the, the the story should be the hero of the picture i mean the the, the an honest something that represents that that's authentic but as soon as you if a picture's too massaged um to me, the, the, you, you, you're looking at, now you're not looking at the story, you're looking at the technique. And uh, if I'm looking at a some of this high dynamic range or something, I look, I think, well, that, that doesn't really look the way, that, that, that doesn't really look real to me. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, well, you know, then, then I, I, they kind of get lost. And so I think it's keep it real, keep it honest. Um, and and just uh, try and have the story be the the hero and and, mm. and you know I mean certainly you know certain areas of the picture need mm. to be light or darkened, um, but mm. uh, it needs to be kind of done with a light touch. Mm. Okay. Um, good advice. I I would have thought. Um, but there's a question here about. Um, your famous photograph of the Afghan girl, Shabak Gula, which says, um, what film stock, ISO, aperture and shutter speed did you uh, shoot for your most iconic uh, image? Um, and uh, you were in a shaded area when you took the photo, I've always wondered. So yeah, if whether you can remember that, I, I maybe you do. <laughs> just just thought, as an aside, where we keep in touch with her, I would say almost weekly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so we're we kind of we're on the phone on on on, on WhatsApp calls. Um, I think it was Kodachrome sixty four, the film. I was um, probably if I had to take a while, because I was probably at a at, at like two eight, uh, at a, either a sixtieth or one twenty fifth, probably one twenty fifth. Um, and uh, there was a lot of light coming in from from the side of a tent, a lot of light coming in, mm -hmm. so. Mm. It was just uh, like that. It, there wasn't any mm. uh, filters, mm. flags, okay. reflectors, or lights. Mm. And it, what what was in that tent is what you see in the picture. The color in the background is all. Thank you. Was. We we also had a question about whether you um, were hope, planning to exhibit in London, but I, I know that uh, Sundram Tagore Gallery has a 
as a branch in London, um, and of course as Photo London. Um, so I, I don't know what the plans are in that respect, but uh... yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking to him and we'll see what he suggests. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, and uh, there's a couple of other uh, images questions. Um, let me just look through. Uh, a some of them are, it's, you know, they, they sort of fall into groups. Um, there's a couple of questions about AI here. I mean, do, do you think AI, I mean, I try not to think about it, unfortunately, but uh, do you worry or think about that, uh, possibly taking over talent and effort? I mean, I don't really see that it impinges on your your practice, but... Steve, I think that uh, uh, if you, I, th I think people are going to want to see a, a real picture of a situation, a place, um, a real portrait that was the photographer and the subject got together and made this portrait. I mean, I, I don't, I don't see it any more than TV replacing, uh, you know, cinema, hmm. or, um, um, you know, or, or painting going away because of photography. I mean, there was all a lot of. I guess uh, back in the hundred years ago, they were saying the painting's dead now because <laughs> you now is uh, so I, I don't I mean mm. painting's alive, mm. uh, so I, I don't see AI. I mean it's yeah. going to be a really big deal, um, and it's going to be used a lot. But I don't see, um, you know, it really it really being a problem for. Mm. Uh, I mean, when you listen to the news, you want to get your news from. The BBC because you know they have they have their reputation at stake. They have professional journalists and they they, they we re rely on them for honest reporting. We we don't want to get some AI kind of making up news about this or the other thing. It has mm -hmm. to be a real person that has uh, you know that that, that has um, uh, you know um, you know skin in the game as they mm. say. Yeah. Um. I think that's uh, answered most of the, the many questions that we've had uh, in. There's been a couple of nice comments, like uh, it's like you were that someone who's um, very inspired by the title and uh, theme of your book. Um, uh, it's like you were some sort of witness and guardian of humanity to me. Um, and she says, has your life been itself a, a life of devotion, which I suppose the way that you handle that theme is is one of devotion to your your profession, your t your craft, your art. Yeah, I always think it's important for us to strive to, uh, you know, leave this world in a better place than we found it. And whether it's through trying to tell stories, trying to share pictures of humanity, and um, in in a, in a kind of a empathetic way. Um, so I, I've tried to do my part. Hmm. Could probably do better probably should do better <laughs> yeah, good. all of us yeah. why when you look at uh you know um uh, you know the red cross or some of these doctors who go to these places and, and they leave their comfortable life they maybe even go to a dangerous place working with people that have been blown apart i mean mm. that's that's amazing i mean mm. we, that, that's a profound mm. Mm. action that they've um you mm. know it's like you know, that's a deep commitment to, mm. to humanity Mm. there's quite a lot um you know beginning to wind up now um but uh there's quite a lot of discussion about care of journalists you know we know that what over 30 journalists are reported killed in in the present conflict um in 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 and around gaza and we have um the uh you know we have obviously photo journalists who report you know and witness traumatic events and so on i mean do you have any thoughts on the kind of the ethics or the care and the just keeping oneself safe as well as you know your duties to those in front of the lens well the, the duty the main thing is to try and tell the story in a, in a truthful way it's it's unimaginable what these photographers and journalists and videographers and writers what they're kind of going through. I know what, you know, the, the, the little bit I've conflict I've seen in, in my career. I mean, it's just trying to survive yourself, just trying to stay alive 
when there's all this chaos and then imagine the, these these you know these photographers there they're trying to find some water they're trying to find themselves some food um they're trying to find a place to charge their their batteries uh and they're trying to ultimately trying to find a way to transmit their pictures out to the world i mean just just the very act of staying alive for them is already a daunting task so i mean it's just overwhelming to imagine what how they're operating in that situation it's just you know we, we can't imagine because we don't mm. think of them as of, of of uh you know also needing to drink and to mm. eat mm. to sleep mm. and and to to you know with their the technical part and then the the, the idea of being intrusive and and photographing these people in front of you who are you know dying it's it's <laughs> it's a lot of it's, it's a lot it's a mm. lot mm. It's, it's 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 a lot to for them is, to. Is that something that you've kind of processed over the years uh, yourself? Because you know you have worked most famously in conflict zones. So, well, I think that what keeps you going is the fact that this, these stories we need to know about what's happening. Um, if we don't if we don't get the news and information from these people then we're stuck with our governments mm. telling us what's going on in the world. And that, that's unacceptable. I mean, mm. we know that governments lie and distort. Mm. Um, mm. So uh, th that's what keep that. That's why you, you, uh, and you feel like this is a sacred mm. mission to go and tell this story, these stories. And, um, you know, and it's, it's just certain people are, built is sort of in their dna to this kind of work i mean when everybody else is heading for the hills certain people mm -hmm. go in and and want to do this kind of work uh, along with the with the doctor mm -hmm. so it's it's um but it's very important and i think that's what kind of mm -hmm. keeps you going to, mm -hmm. you to know that you're there it's terrible but mm -hmm. it, it, somebody needs to tell that story well, we're very glad um, and grateful for your devotion to your to your art and uh, reporting and, and photography and uh, for going in there for us and um, showing us humanity uh, in all its vulnerability and care and uh, coming out with, I think, an, uh, in these troubling times, a, a, a message that is life affirming. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for that and humane. And uh, I'm tremendously grateful uh to you steve mccurry congratulations again on the, uh, a wonderful book um and uh to reiterate the point that it, you should be able to find the link in the chat not in the q a but in the chat thank you to the audience um for all uh your very well put questions um and also thank you to photo london uh, and sundaram tagore gallery um for their um uh, staging of this uh, event and uh, we wish you very well uh, in your future project Steve so thank you pleasure to spend time with you thank you very much thank you